So, okay. Well, here's the thing. So today I need to show you guys some of the, you know, the little technical stuff about Photoshop that uh, this is not, well, I'll show you a couple little how to's in there, but more so just some of the general like basic technical stuff. That's just kind of good to know about Photoshop. So, okay. It's best if you just see it than if I just yammer on talking about it. So here's Photoshop, right? One thing is Illustrator uses vectors. Vector means basically that uh, it's a, a path that uses some kind of logarithm or something. Long story short, you can zoom in forever and it never shows a pixel. It's not made of pixels. It's, it's just a curve as a path, right? So Photoshop works with bitmap or raster or pixels. They're all basically synonymous. And, uh, you know, you zoom in close enough and it's going to look like this. You'll, you'll see the pixels. If you use high resolution, the pixels are so small, you don't notice them until you zoom in close, but they're there. A pixel is like the molecule or the atom of Photoshop. Eventually, like even over here, this is not truly a vector. This is an example of one, but like, you know, you zoom in close enough, boom, look at this. It's made of pixels. So um, if you use something in, in Illustrator, just know that uh, it's going to be perfectly curved. And in Photoshop, it may appear to be perfectly curved depending on what resolution you use, um, but it's, it's not. So here's the thing. Illustrator and Photoshop, they both do distinct things. I prefer using Photoshop because there's a lot of things Photoshop can do that Illustrator really can't do uh, very easily. However, what they both do, Illustrator does better. Illustrator does a clearer job of it. But again, there's some things that, that you can do in Photoshop. You just can't really do in Illustrator, not practically. So again, pixels, raster, bitmap, they mean it's made of pixels. It's usually not that pixelated. Again, this is just for effect. Usually like this is we usually go for high quality stuff. Just know. You keep on zooming in, you're going to see those atoms, those pixels, they'll, they'll show up. Okay, so uh, there's that. Resolution, um, when you first open Photoshop, it's going to ask you immediately, uh, like, what resolution do you want? So here's the thing. If you're doing something for the web, you can do 72 resolution, and you're usually fine. Um, however, I almost always recommend 300, um, because I'd like to have the option to print it. And even if it's something I'm doing for the internet, I'd rather err on the side of doing too high quality than, than not high quality enough. What that means is 300 or 72 or whatever. So sometimes you'll see it as DPI, that stands for dots per inch. Uh, so 75 dots per inch and uh, 300 dots per inch. If you see it as PPI, that's pixels per inch. And don't worry. Uh, your thoughts over it just is basically the same thing. Resolution is what resolution is. So here's kind of an example. If you do 10 PP, it's, it's really pixels per line per square inch. So having said that, they're they're big pixels. So it's noticeably very pixelated, right? The 20 PPI, I mean, already you can see the difference. Uh, this is much more clear on the right than it is on the left. However, it's still very pixelated. 20 pixels per line per, per square inch, um, you would really see the staircase. That doesn't look like a circle as much as a staircase. So just imagine once you get up to 72 or 300, the pixels are so fine at 300 that the naked eye can't tell the difference. There's no need, by the way, to make it like 500 resolution or 1000 resolution, unless you're doing, uh, I don't know, some logo that um, is going to be blown up onto a... Um, a billboard or a truck, maybe do higher resolution. But for all practical purposes, 300 resolution, nobody's going to really notice a pixel. They're, they're too fine. They're like little grains of sand at that point. So no need to make it 500. 300 is fine. Um, 500 will make, it'll bog your, your computer down. The file size is too big. Okay, so here's the difference. So you can see it practically on a real project. This is um, fairly high resolution. This is not. You do not want to turn in this kind of project. If you're working on a project, unless you intentionally are going for very, very old Nintendo game style, which is rare, it happens, you don't want it to look like that. Don't have a janky project, have a good project. Go for this, not this. Does that make sense? So um, having said that, 
if you want to make Bobby, your friend, look like old school Mario, you can go to filter, then down to pixelate, and then to mosaic. Filter, pixelate, mosaic, and you can do it. You can make it just as pixely as you want to. Um, just know that, uh, okay, this is like, uh, you know, you can always get older, but you can't get young again. You can always take a clear picture and make it blurry. You can't really take a, a blurry or pixely picture and make it clear again. I mean, you can throw some makeup on it just like you can, but it's, it ain't really making it good again. Does that make sense? Okay. That's, if you have any questions, just let me know. Okay, some of the other technical stuff. At the top, where it says image mode, there's different options. Grayscale will just gray everything out. It'll have black, white, and every all the spectrum of grays, dark grays, light grays, stuff like that. Also, it says uh, RGB color and CMYK color. So RGB stands for red, green, and blue. And uh, CMYK technically stands for cyan, magenta, yellow, and key. Key is black. There's already a B taken for blue in RGB. So it's cyan, magenta, yellow, and key, or, or black, right? So here's the difference. Why are there two different kinds? Mr. Cox, why do they even exist? Why are there two? Why don't they just have one? Well, okay, calm down. First of all, if you were doing something for print, literal, tangible, touchable ink, they, they use cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And those four colors mix together to make basically any other color. Are there some colors that are um, not printable? Sure. But for all practical purposes, um, you can mix cyan, magenta, yellow, and black together to uh, make basically any color, right? So if you're going to print something, go to image mode, make it CMYK and see what it looks like, right? Um, the, this is called subtractive color. Okay, so here, let me unshare my screen so you can see. Okay. So pretend my shirt is red. It is not, but pretend it's bright red. Really what happens, there's a light source like this. Oh, here's the light. And the spectrum of colors comes, like the prism of colors comes, right? And the colors are absorbed except the red reflects, right? So it's called subtractive color because uh, most colors were, were losing colors. Just one color happens to be reflected, right? That's subtractive color. So when you do the other, okay, this is probably too much information. Do you have to memorize all this stuff? No, you really do not. Is it interesting? Yes, it is interesting. I'm going to share my screen again. Now. Okay, so here's the thing. The um, computer screen is made up, you know, like a TV screen, made up of a little bitty, I mean, you zoom in close, well, you can't see it. You just like get a magnifying glass or something. You can look on your own screen and uh, there's little bitty tiny red, green, and blue bulbs up in there, right? So that's called additive color because your screen. Okay, let me undo the share screen again. So you see, okay, pretend this is your computer screen. This is not. This is your screen. It is putting out colors. It's adding color to the world. It's not subtracting color from the world. It's adding. However, instead of just like, oh man, I came surprisingly close to touching. <laughs> so okay, um, it has little bitty red, green, and blue bulbs, and. Uh, you know, you can they can add those together in varying degrees, a little more red, a little less blue, and they mix together and they make new colors. So uh, anyway, additive color, uh, computer web color, bulb color is red, green, and blue. And you shine all those little color lights close enough together and at a high enough frequency, then it can create kind of a, a white light. So anyway, this adding color to the world. If you're doing something for the web, go to image mode. RGB. If you're doing something for print, do image mode CMYK because ink is cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Little bitty bulbs are red, green, and blue. And uh, and so that, that's why those exist. So, okay. Anywho, um, let's see what else we have here. Uh, for the image size, you can change the size of any image. You go to image, image size. And if, let's say you're working on something, oh man, I didn't mean for it to be this size. Just change the size. We'll leave it at that because I talked for too long about the different colors. Okay, typography. Uh, if you're in the class and have been for a while, you've heard it mentioned before. If you missed today, you might have missed it. Here's the thing. Typography is the art of letters and numbers. You can get all technical. There are, um, oh man, there's so many little technical parts. If you're study, studying for a graphic design test in college, 
then it's, it's helpful to know this. Some of this, depending on the professor, if you're just using it to make a project, you probably don't need to know all these things right now. Or just, just know that they exist. Like, I mean, you could see this is called a descender that comes down. This is called an ascender. Uh, that's probably enough for now talking about that. Okay, the word readability, it literally means readability. So if you hear that, they're not trying to trick you like this. It doesn't matter if something looks cool. If it looks cool and it's hard to read, people may not even take the time to try to read it. This is hard to read, right? So uh, if you ever hear someone mention readability, just make it, it doesn't necessarily have to be simple, but it needs to be very, very easy to read. You, people, you don't want people to spend 10 seconds trying to read your project. They may not even take the time. Okay, here's the thing. This is not an exhaustive list. There are more of these, but uh, you're bound to come across hearing about the elements of design or the elements of art. And the, the second list is the principles of design. So, okay, here's the easy way to remember. My daughters are in elementary school. They, can, they're not high school principals. Could they go out and be a high school principal? Maybe someday, but they gotta finish elementary school first. Elementary principal elements, principles. So here's the thing, before you can get to principles, you have to have elements first. That, okay, here, let me show you an example. I'm gonna do, I'm doing a lot of share screens and back and forth. So, okay. The, the elements are the things that an elementary student would know, like line. You can have a line by, an, by itself. Here, I'll make one right now. You don't need something else to have a line. You just need a line to have a line. It is what it is, is what is uh, the popular phrase right now, right? So let me just show you. I'll just, I'll just go. I'll just click on a little brush right here. I'll make it very small. And then, look at this. I made a line. So um, a line is what it is. Color is what it is. Shape, size, uh, value. Value meaning like it fades from this end of the spectrum to that end of the spectrum. This lightness to that darkness. This is a uh, value. So this is, you know, dark green all the way up to light green. Okay, so anyway, um, let's see here. Space and size, they're, they're simple. If you ask my daughters what these are, they could tell you exactly. A principle, you you need at least one element in order to create principles. So here's an example. Like contrast, you can't just have contrast by itself. You need two colors to have contrast, like green and red. There's contrast between the two, right? Um, or you need size to have contrast, like big and small. That's contrast, but you needed size to do it. Or, um, you know, ugly and pretty. That's contrast, but you needed something else to, to have it. Okay, so uh, repetition, that's another example. You can't just have repetition by itself. You need, like, shapes to do it. Circle, square, circle, square, circle, square. That's repetition, re repetition but you needed shapes to do it. Or colors to do it, like uh, red, white, blue, red, white, blue, red, white, blue. That's repetition, but you needed color to do it, right? So you need the, the elements to build on one, or, one another to create the principles, right? So um, anyway, and this is not an exhaustive list either. There, there are more uh, different ones. And, you know, if you look online for a list of principles of design, some may have more than others, uh, but basically all these things uh, on both lists are little arrows in your quiver. There are little things for your arsenal ideas for projects so sometimes you may think what else could i add to this project well what interesting thing can i do with lines can i do straight lines can i do spiral lines can i do diagonal lines what interesting things can i do with color can i uh can i sub can i subtract all the color and have it black and white and only one thing's in color like a little girl in black and white but she's holding a pink rose right or um if i'm doing a poster for auburn can i make the background just orange um and uh, make the foreground just blue, things like that. So um, shape and size, can I, can I interchange the sizes for visual interest? Can I change that person who's small on a bridge? Can I make them larger than the bridge? That'd get people's attention if there's a person larger than a bridge, things like that, right? 
So um, same thing over here. Is there um, something that I could repeat for visual interest? Uh, what's another one um, that stands out? Uh, uh, pattern, I guess that's, that's basically the same as repetition. Sometimes you can break a pattern or break repetition for, for visual interest. So like, uh, let's say there's smiley face, smiley face, smiley face, smiley face, smiley face, angry face, smiley face, smiley face, smiley face. That'll pop out as the angry face, right? So um, anyway, you you can't have principles all by themselves. You need uh, the elements to do it, right? So again, repetition, um, big, big, small, big, big, small, big, big, small. It took size to do that repetition. Okay, there we go. And then, oh, there's something I was going to show you about this. I think I remember. So, um, okay, there's two things. One is... Um, so a smart object is uh, sometimes a pain. Sometimes, let me just show you. I'm going to turn this into a smart object. I'm going to right-click it and go to convert to smart object. Sometimes you, you bring in something to Photoshop. It has this little thing in the corner. And uh, in that little thing in the corner, uh, you know what? Here's the thing. This is going to be more complex. I'm going to make this a separate lesson, right? So we'll, we'll be done with this lesson. And then we'll do a separate one on just smart objects. How about that? Okay. So if you have any questions, just holler and I'll, you know, help you out best as I can. This went on longer than I thought. But it's good vocabulary words for Photoshop. And I really think that sometimes the best way to